Old Testament reading for this Ash Wednesday is from the prophet Joel, the second chapter. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet at Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage your reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? Who are these clothed in white robes, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the word of the Lord. St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, 
Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust destroys and where, there, and, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. to you at peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That hymn we just sang is a brand new hymn. It was just written uh, months ago and I hope you like it and, and it, I hope it, it grows on you. We're going to be singing it each Wednesday as our theme hymn but I especially want to uh, commend to you to your uh, devotional uh, 
for your devotional purposes the words, the lyrics, which I think are profound in what they teach us about what our God, what we have done and what our God has done to fix the mess that we have made of things. Recently, I, I read um, that the worldwide, the worldwide apparel industry, clothing, you know, and the worldwide apparel industry, that it is valued at, get this, at valued at over $3 trillion. Wow. That is, uh, if I did the math correctly, that is um, $3,000 billion. And it, and, it, and it represents about 2% of the world's gross domestic product. Clothing, the apparel industry. I, I, I think we can easily conclude that as a human race, we love our clothing. I mean, take a walk through a shopping mall and you'll see one clothing store after another, offering one style of garment after another. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, there's even a church liturgical clothing company that offers something close to designer clergy shirts if you want to part with a hundred bucks and give your pastor a gift. I'm not suggesting that, but that is how far it has gone. Now I'd like you to imagine the opposite. I'd like you to imagine if there was only one clothing store, and if there was only one style of clothing intended for every man, woman, and child on the planet, how on earth would we express our individuality? How would we strut our stuff? How would we survive without the rags and coverings of our choice, after all? Just taking a look around at the various people sitting here today, you can see it not, I don't, I can't imagine one person or two people wearing the same thing. They're all wearing something different. But that really begs the question, what are you covering up? What are we covering up? Our coverings may be beautiful, but what lurks beneath? The answer is that we are covering up our nakedness. Why? Because we are modest and we're proper people. But there is more to it than just that. You see, in Holy Scripture, coverings, garments, and clothing that cover nakedness are in reality covering our shame. Adam and Eve partook of the free of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And they realized their nakedness, and then suddenly they knew their sin. And because of that knowledge, they were ashamed. And as a result, they sewed together fig leaves as clothing so that God would not see their shame in an attempt to keep him from discovering their sin when he walks through the garden. But as we all know, it didn't work. It didn't work because it was, in reality, the wrong kind of garment. You see, we wear our beautiful clothes to hide our nakedness. We believe that we can deceive God and, and he will not notice our shame. If we could just cover up our nakedness Maybe God won't find out. We want to be responsible. We want to cover our sin. But try as hard as we might, it just doesn't work. Our man-made garments are but filthy rags. And what they attempt to cover is even worse. You see, because of Adam and Eve, our hearts are filled with sin. They're filled with shame. And if the desires of our heart were ever to be made known, 
if, if for all to see, if the veil was ever to be pulled back so people could truly see what was in our heart, oh my, we would indeed all be ashamed. I mean, evil thoughts, sexual desires, selfish wants, impure motives, jealousy, anger, envy, drunkenness, strife, idolatry. Do I have to go on? I think you get the idea. This is the condition of our hearts. This is the condition of our being that we seek to hide, that we attempt to cover with our man-made clothing. Yet man is not able, he's not even capable of hiding the truth from God. We may fool those around us. We may even be fooled by those around us. But our Lord God sees our sinful condition. He sees what we think we, is in secret. He, he sees it and he knows that sinful condition of our hearts. And so it's proper for us to hear today as we hear each year on this day, from dust we came and to dust we shall return. See, humanity is born into this world a sinner, even conceived into this world a sinner. And humanity's journey back to the ground is a journey that goes back to the dust. All our attempts to cover up our sin, every effort to pay up always results in the same destination, dust. We're born to die. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. It's into this sorry spiritual, spiritual state of affairs that the prophet Joel speaks. The people of Israel had wandered away from their God. They had been unfaithful in every single way imaginable. They sought after other gods. They played the harlot. The bottom line, they are guilty of spiritual adultery against their Lord God. And so the Lord is going to unleash disaster upon them. They will be oppressed. They are going to be persecuted. They will become a byword for the world to mock God. They will suffer want. They're going to weep in their distress. But Joel cries out, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts, not your garments. You see, the ancient tradition was to express terrible anxi anxiety and distress by tearing your garments, by ripping them, thereby revealing the state of your sorrow. But Joel, Joel knows that rending, the rending of the garments will only reveal a problem. And the problem that it's going to reveal is a sinful heart. You see, a torn garment only shows the problem. Rather, whereas a torn heart begins to heal the problem. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Put on sackcloth and ashes. Repent. Return to the Lord. King David tells us in Psalm 51, that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Repent. Return to the Lord. Yes, it's a journey, a Lenten journey, a return from exile. Our sin has indeed separated us from God. Our sin has created a dividing wall of hostility that destroys the relationship between God and us. Our sin has exiled us from the presence of the Lord, and He has seen our sin. 
and he knows our shame and that sin and shame have, have exiled us from his presence. So return, dear friends, return to the Lord with repentant hearts. Put on sackcloth and ashes, that is, repent. So we've gathered here this afternoon. A little rain outside, kind of nice, but we've gathered here to put on ashes. We've gathered here to repent of our sin. We know our sin and it is ever before us. We know the sorry condition of our blackened hearts. We know that we of our own strength and power cannot return from our sin-stained exile. We know that of our own power that we cannot return to the presence of, of our God. The ashes are there to remind us of our sin. They remind us of the condition of our hearts. They remind us of how we constantly approach our relationship with God on our terms and not his, his terms. These ashes remind us of our own adultery against God. We cannot fix our sinful mess. But ashes, note this, ashes that are in the sign of a cross remind us of another. The ashes and the sign of a cross remind us of a gracious and merciful God. We who are helpless and hopeless sinners are told, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We who can do nothing at all have a God who is willing to do everything and in fact has done everything. The ashes here show our sin, but the ashes in the sign of a cross show us the true nature of our God. The cross, an instrument of torture and death, the means by which God has chosen to cleanse our hearts and, and exchange our garments. The cross, the place where Jesus is raised up in our place. The cross, the place where Jesus is stripped of his robe and all of our sin is revealed as he hangs naked in our stead. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for you. Sometimes we attempt to cover up our sin. Sometimes we might even be foolish enough to try to justify our sin. But Jesus reveals it so that it might be washed away by his blood. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Ashes and the sign of a cross. A gracious and merciful God has offered up his only begotten son so that the sin that has exiled us from his presence might be washed away and we might be restored to his presence, a return from exile, which is our Lenten journey. And where does this journey end? Well, I got news for you. It doesn't end at the cross. It doesn't even end at the empty tomb. You see, where our journey ends is in the courts of heaven. Listen again. To the words of St. John as he describes those who are gathered around the throne of the Lamb in his kingdom. 
John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice the great multitude of people waving palm branches as they worshiped their Savior? Did you notice that they were all clothed in white robes? They weren't clothed with fig leaves. <laughs> they were not adorned with filthy rags of their own creation. They are clothed in white robes. Robes that have been cleansed. Robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Their garments of sackcloth have been exchanged for robes of righteousness. The sackcloth and ashes are gone for Christ's journey to the cross clothes his bride, the church. You see, it is the blood of Jesus that washes away sin. It is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us all from unrighteousness. It is the blood of Jesus that washes our robes and makes them bright white. It is the blood of Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said of his blood when he said, Take and drink. This is the blood of the covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Dear friends, salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Blackened, corrupt hearts covered by fig leaves of our own ideas of what our relationship with God should be like is the cause of our exile. The failings of popular American Christianity, if it feels good, do it type of stuff, is what leads us astray. Astray from the presence of God. Exiled from the presence of God. And the result is ashes are placed on our foreheads. So we come before God with repentant hearts because God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He gives his son to suffer in our place. Jesus endures the cross in our stead, in our place. His blood is shed his holy and precious blood that washes away and cleanses us all from sin. And in a moment, you're going to hear these words, take and drink. This is given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. The result, our hearts are restored. Our sackcloth, is, sackcloth and ashes are exchanged for garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. The exile is over. The journey is finished. We are returned to the presence of God, and we rejoice in the robes of the bridegroom that he has provided for his bride, you, his bride. Have a blessed Lenten time. In Jesus' name. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.